Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Life Sciences Grade 12. Today is the day we are marking the memorandum, guys. I hope you... So please send it back as soon as possible so that I can continue with the marking. Can you hear me? Okay, I think we're fine. So the email address is dgupera2204. If you're still going to send me some more uh, assessments, ne? So this was the paper you did yesterday. Mark allocation was 150. And duration is two hours, 30 minutes. So we'll just sum it up. I think we'll do it. The memo will cover today and tomorrow. Question one, various options are provided as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the number and write only the letter A to D next to the question numbers. So for example, in your answer book, if it's question 1.1, you write 1.1.1D, you know, things like that. So don't, don't use it any other way. That's how you should do it. So question 1.1.1. Okay, guys, I, I think it's important to note that most of these questions here are extracted from past papers so that you can get used to how questions are asked and structured and you can prepare yourself, right? So I encourage you after this to also go out and do more past papers so that you can prepare yourself. You'll be better prepared, especially for you guys, since you are writing a national paper at the end of the year. So now on the question 1.1.1, which one of the following involves the development of the young inside the uterus of the mother? and where it receives nutrients through the placenta. So this one here, which one? There's the ovipari, there's the vivipari, there's ovovivipari and amniotic egg. So in which of these four is there development of the young inside the uterus of the mother and where it receives nutrients through the placenta? That is the vivipari. Right? Example is us human beings, that's how our young develop inside the uterus. And then 1.1.2, below is a list of terms relating to reproduction. So which one here, which of the terms above refer to strategies using birds that incubate their eggs in a nest and in their nest and feed their young until they are able to fly? So these terms over there, is, this, is it the pre precocial development? Is the altricial development, amniotic egg or parental care? So all of these four uh, terms that are listed here, which ones refer to strategies that birds used to incubate their eggs in their nest and also to feed their young until they're able to fly? So which of the steps there? Answer is C, which is, Let's highlight that section two, three, and four, meaning it's the altricial development, it's amniotic egg, and it's parental care. So these steps are done until the, the, the young of the beds is able to fly. There's the altricial development, there's the amniotic egg, in this parental care. And then question 1.1.3. And you see how I'm answering the, the questions here on the side. That's exactly how you should write your answers in the answer book. Question 1.1.3. Which part of the eye absorbs excess light? You did this uh, term two. Yes. Which part of the eye absorbs excess light? It is the choroid. The choroid is the region of the eye which absorbs excess light. You remember this work. 
Question 1.1.4, which one of the following activities will help to maintain biodiversity in a country? You, we started with this topic in grade 10, so you should also be able to remember, and you also did it as you went along in the grade. Is it habitat destruction? Is it poaching? Is it the introduction of alien plants? Or is it the sustainable use of plant and animal resources? And our answer is D because we need to use our plants and animals in, in a sustainable manner. So even if let's say you, you, you uproot a certain plant, you need to replant it, you know, so that we have these, these organisms remain sustainable, meaning they can be there for more generations to come. Even our animals, we need to be very careful with how we treat our animals. So no poaching. We can't be disrupting the habitats. We can't be introducing alien plants because they are bad for the natural plants in that particular area. So we need to be practicing sustainable use of these plants and animal resources, like planting more trees, like ensuring we water our plants, we take care of our animals, we protect them from poaching and other means that will aim to, to eradicate them because we need these to be sustainable and be available for generations and generations to come. Question 1.1.5 and question 1.1.6 are based on the following, on the flow diagram below. A person consumes a meal high in salt. Then step two, that land secretes mm, aldosterone, X aldosterone. Then reabsorption of salt in the kidneys, Y and then normal salt level in the blood. So you see here, this is a, a part of negative feedback mechanism, whereby it, the, the salt level has, in, has, has, has increased from, from normal salt concentrations in the body to high salt when you eat what? When you eat a meal that is high in salt. So the, condition, the salt concentration is increasing here. And then which gland secretes a, yeah, which gland secretes this part, the aldosterone? Then there's the reabsorption of the salt in the kidneys by what over here to bring back the, the salt levels to normal. So you can do yourself a favor maybe by starting to fill in the spaces yourself before you even get answered the questions get asked the questions or you can shoot straight to the question. Yeah? Question 1.1.5, which gland secretes aldosterone? So which of the glands here listed will secrete aldosterone? We remember this gland and you can even get a clue here. It's the reabsorption of salt in the kidneys. So which gland do you find uh, at the kidneys? It is the adrenal gland. The, the adrenal gland is the one that secretes aldosterone. Then, which one of the following is correct with regards to X and Y in the flow diagram? So you see it can either be more or less. S X could either mean more or less. So let's go check. Gland secretes more aldosterone or the gland secretes less aldosterone. Which one is it? So how does the, the negative feedback regulation or the homeostatic control of salt concentration work when there's a high level of salt in the body? The gland will secrete more aldosterone or the gland will secrete less aldosterone. Which one is it? The gland will secrete less aldosterone. Why? Because aldosterone is secreted to increase levels of salt in the body. So when there's already high levels of salt in the body, then it would, it would stop the secretion. So right now we are between these two. We are between the B and the D, right? Less, less. We'll select our final answer based on Y. So for now, you, you note your, your answers, you note them. And then D for Y, the reabsorption of salt in the kidneys now, will it increase or will it decrease? What will happen with the reabsorption of salt? 
Will it increase or will it decrease? Remember the process of reabsorption. This is after, remember the processes of actually the urinary system in the kidney. What happens? The first step or the first process is ultrafiltration, whereby the blood that enters the nephron is filtered through the process of ultrafiltration. Then all those molecules are removed into the capsular space. And then whatever is after when there's a regulation now during reabsorption, you know, the body or the blood will, will alert about which uh, molecules are missing. Then reabsorption will happen again. If there's, there's too low concentrations of salt in the kidney, the reabsorption of more salts from the filtrate to the blood will happen. But if there's high concentrations of salt, then what happens? The reabsorption will decrease because already inside the, the blood or the kidney, there's already high levels of salt. So reabsorption from the filtrate to the kidney will, from the filtrate to the tubules will stop, right? It will decrease. So that's what exactly would happen over here. It would decrease because you already have high levels of salt. So the reabsorption will decrease. I hope that explains and makes sense. If you have forgotten that, go review the part. We learned about this work in term two when we did um, endocrine system. And we also covered it when we discussed homeostasis. But you can also revise it from your grade 11 when you did the urinary system. That will help you remember and figure it out. And you need to understand terminologies such as what we mean by reabsorption you know, so that you understand exactly that, that process in the urinary system or in the nephron. And then question, so the answer is D here, meaning over here, a uh, person consumed, consumes a meal high in salt, then the gland, which is the adrenal gland, will secrete less aldosterone, and then, let me write, will secrete less aldosterone, and then the reabsorption of salt in the kidneys will also decrease. Then when the reabsorption process uh, is decreasing there, that means the blood, the, the blood salt levels will go back to normal. So remember these points. Reabsorption is a process that happens during the urinary system. It's a process you find in the nephrons. So remember that process there. And what else? The gland, the gland is adrenal gland, which is the one responsible for the secretion of aldosterone. So this is part of the negative feedback mechanism. The reverse would happen if you had low salt concentrations. Then question 1.1.7. During an investigation, a man was placed in an airtight room. Sensors were used to monitor his breathing and heart rate. The investigators were able to change the environmental conditions in the room. After 30 minutes, the man's breathing and heart rate had increased. So here, this is an investigation. Then this room here is airtight, you know, it's, it's literally closed, it's secluded. Sensors are used to monitor this man's breathing and heart rate. Then these investigators were also able to change the environments in that room. So initially it was airtight, then the conditions were, were measured, the sensors were measuring the breathing and the heart rate. Then they later on changed the conditions in the environment. And then 30 minutes after that change, the, the men's breathing rate and uh, breathing and heart rate increased. So the investigators changed the environmental conditions in the room by either A, where did they decrease the light intensity? B, did they increase the amount of carbon dioxide in the air? C, did they decrease the humidity? Or D, did they increase the amount of oxygen in the air? So before we find this answer, you need to see what happened. This is an investigation in an airtight room. So this is, can be tip number one. Sensors are used to monitor the breathing and heart rate. So we need to pay attention to the breathing and heart rate. Investigators then change the conditions. And then 30 minutes after that changed conditions, this man's breathing and heart rate increased. So remembering the gaseous exchange topic, 
it was covered in, in details in grade 11, but also a bit of grade 12 here. So breathing and heart rate increased. What exactly happens if your breathing and heart rate increase in your, in the, in your body? You remember with gaseous exchange, what happens when your breathing and heart rate increase? That is when the body is trying to get more oxygen. So this means high levels of carbon dioxide were detected in your blood. Then the process whereby the medulla oblongata would sense using the chemo, the, through the chemoreceptors, it would detect that change whereby there are increased levels of carbon dioxide in the blood. And then what would it do? It will ensure that it, 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 it starts reactions whereby the heart, breathes, the heart beats faster and your breathing rate increase. Why? So that your body can take in oxygen at a higher rate and exhale carbon dioxide at a higher rate. That happens, it, it speeds up the process of cellular respiration, you understand? It speeds up that process whereby now you are, re, you are releasing more carbon dioxide and you are take, in taking more oxygen. And the heart is breathing faster because now it needs to pump this oxygenated blood to more organs where it is needed. We discussed this part just briefly in grade 12 when we discussed homeostasis in, of the carbon dioxide concentrations, homeostatic control of carbon dioxide concentrations. I remember we discussed it there, but if you need more understanding on this topic, Grade 11 human gases exchange covers this in details where it explains what I just explained to you. But again, what I said to you is enough. The chemoreceptors detect the change whereby there are increased carbon dioxide levels in the body. Then what happens? The medulla oblongata ensures that the breathing rate and heart rate uh, increase. Why is the heart rate increasing so that the oxygenated blood can be pumped faster? The breathing rate is increasing so you can be able to take in more oxygen and exhale more carbon dioxide at a faster rate. So this happens only when there was an increase in carbon dioxide. If there was an increase of carbon dioxide in the air, it means you are now taking in more carbon dioxide, which then changed your blood pH. That's one of the things that the chemoreceptors will detect, the change in blood pH it would become more acidic when there's more carbon dioxide. And that's when all these reactions would start to happen. So the, 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 the investigators increased the amount of carbon dioxide in the air. Why they did that, I do not know, because they are not supposed to do that. Why, Why are they increasing the amount of uh, carbon dioxide in the air? Because people need enough oxygen to breathe. So they did this. It's wrong, it's not right, it's unlawful, in fact. Can't torture someone by taking away air for them to breathe. Anyway, question 1.1.8. Which one of the following is a consequence of the destruction of wetlands? So wetlands, what is the consequence of the destruction of wetlands? Do you have increased runoff of rainwater? Do you have increased biodiversity? Do you have increase in water availability? Is there an increase of water quality? Which one of these four are a consequence of the destruction of wetlands? It's important, you know, sometimes when you don't really know the answer for effect, you, you infer whatever you know. Ne? So you'll use uh, information of what you do know, apply it in this question, to try and eliminate, to be left with that one answer, to try and deduce the, the main answer. Mainly this is the consequence. So this is the effect, right? Of the destruction of wetlands. So if you destruct wetlands, what could be the possible effect or outcome? Would be there an increase in the runoff of water? Remember wetlands are an important part of our Biodiversity, important, right? So now, basically what we mean here is when you distract that, which is important in our biodiversity, that consequence that will happen will be a negative consequence. You understand that? We need wetlands. They're important in our biodiversity and in our ecosystems. 
So if you distract these wetlands, whatever consequence that would come from there would be negative, given on that fact. And next up, now we need to find from the options we are given, we need to find the negative consequence that is listed there. So this is when you are inferring knowledge, you're inferring what you know, right? And one other thing, in this case, you need to also understand your terminologies. Consequence is, is like an effect, like I mentioned. But whenever the word consequence is used, it means whatever effect that happens is unpleasant or is unwelcome, you understand? So pay attention to the terminologies that are used. They will direct you to the answer even if you didn't really know the answer for effect. You can be able to deduce the answer from that. So the terminology you understand is the consequences effect. And when consequence is used, it usually means it's an unpleasant effect. It's an unwelcome effect. And we need wetlands. So of course now this consequence will be unpleasant. It would be bad. So let's look at our options. A, it's increased runoff of water, of rainwater. B is increased biodiversity. C is increase in water availability and D is increase of water quality. Now, when we're looking at these answers here, we can clearly see that D, D is, is a positive effect. And we are not looking for that. We are looking for a negative effect because you are destroying something that we need, which are wetlands. It wouldn't be an increase in water availability because that is a positive effect. It wouldn't be an increase in biodiversity because it's a positive effect. Also, when you destroy wetlands, you are actually destroying a lot of biodiversity that exists there and that survives on wetlands. So you would actually be decreasing bio, uh, biodiversity. You would actually be decreasing water availability. And you'll also be decreasing the quality of water. Why? Because you would be increasing the runoff of rainwater. In wetlands, the water is processed in such a way that it can have storage reserves, but now you are destroying it completely. So the answer here is A, we have to choose the answer. So if you knew it from the word go, then good for you. But for those who probably maybe might not really know the answer from the get go, this is the technique I'm teaching you. Please use that. Infer what you know. You keep the words you're given, the statement, and, and pay attention to the terminologies that are used. Like I showed you, consequence, destruction, wetlands. We know about wetlands. We are needing them in the biodiversity in, in our ecosystem. Consequence, you know, do that. It will help you. You'd, you'd be amazed how, how much your marks improve if you apply this technique because you won't always know all the answers. Sometimes it happens. Yes, I encourage you to study. Do your best in your preparation. Literally put in your all your efforts towards preparation. My teacher always said to us, proper, uh, what, proper preparation prevents poor performance. So those are the five Ps. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. So this means here, you are properly prepared before anything and you are ensured that you will definitely not perform poorly. And then now when it's time for the exam, you have your own much control over anything. You've done all you could, you've studied, but it comes, you come across a question, you are not really sure how to answer it, then those are the steps you follow. Always, always apply yourself and give yourself to your work. And then next question, 1.1.9 for nine. The annual average temperature of a country was recorded over the past 100 years. The information is represented in the graph below. Oh, this is what the annual average temperature of a country. Remember, temperature is a determining factor of the climate of a particular region, right? Uh, temperature and rainfall. So it was recorded over the past 100 years. So we see here in 1990, this is on the x axis, it's the years, number of years, it's the years, and on the y axis is the average annual temperature in degrees Celsius. So in 1900s, the average annual temperature was less than nine degrees Celsius. 
maybe this could be about 8.9 degrees Celsius there or 8.8. .8. In 1925, it was at about 9.4 degrees Celsius. In 1950, it was 9.8 degrees Celsius. And then 1975, it was about 9.6, 9.7 there. So 1990 to 1950, the temperatures increased. Then it decreased a bit in 1975 and increased once again in 2000, whereby it was now at above 10, maybe 10.1 degrees Celsius. So based on this graph now, which one of the following is a possible inference that can be made from the information in the graph? So based on this graph, what, what inference can you make? A, global warming has caused habitat destruction. B, ozone depletion has occurred. C, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are increasing. D, desertification has occurred as a result of global warming. Guys, based on this graph that we are given, the answer should be based on the graph we are looking at. And the graph we are looking at only tells us about the average temperature and the years. You are not getting any other information on this graph except for temperature. So what, uh, when we look at temperature, what other issues can we touch on when we discuss temperature? It certainly will not be uh, global warming has caused habitat destruction. We are eliminating, let me use the red pen for the eliminations. It certainly wouldn't be this answer. Why? Because we, the, we are not getting that information from the graph. We, we, are, we, we can't deduce that much already based on the given information. And the question is clear. Based on the information on the graph, or oh, which one of the following is a possible inference? This one here of habitat destruction would require additional research which or information which is currently not given. So habitat destruction, that is not it. Global warming has, you know, we can see maybe effects when increase in temperatures. Yes, that could be because of global warming, right? Because the temperatures are increasing, they would result in global warming. But the fact that now global warming has caused habitat destruction is something additional that we can't deduce from the graph. Ozone depletion has occurred. That also is something we cannot at the moment deduce from the graph because all we are seeing here is the increasing temperatures. So what we can deduce from that is through the increasing temperatures, it means there's the global warming is becoming a thing. You understand it's, it's, it's something that's increasing now. Not anything about depletion of the ozone. C, carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are increasing that we can then deduce because then if we are increasing the heat it means not enough carbon dioxide is leaving the atmosphere it's directly related to what we are seeing on the graph which is speaking about temperatures so that means here the carbon dioxide level atmosphere are increasing so that we see it from the levels of increased temperatures because when there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere there is more there's an increased uh, temperature d is desertification has occurred as a result of global warming we can't we can agree with the part of global warming but like question a and b we can't really deduce this fact of desertification that would need additional research you see so you can't really, this one, see, all of them could be correct if you had additional information. But based on this, so these, the information presented to us, the most correct answer is C. And that's how you should approach your multiple choice questions. You would have the most correct answer and you would have an answer that is, it is correct, but not the most correct. And we are going for the most correct answer in multiple choice. Guys, I hope this is clear. I hope this was helpful to you guys. Moving on to question 1.2. Give the correct biological term for each of the following descriptions. Write only the term next to the question numbers. 
only the term is it's here next to the question numbers don't write don't rewrite the whole question you'll be wasting your time so there we go 1.2.1 the structures formed by the centrioles during cell division what are those structures we've been discussing these these are spindle fibers or spindle threads and like invisible threads they, that form during cell division and then they are okay what in mitosis they okay in the prophase phase right 1.2.2 receptors that provide information about the position of the head that are those are the maculae those receptors are called maculae and then 1.2.3 a hormone that regulates the water balance in the body this one regulates water balance we just in this question we discussed the one that regulates salt it works hand in hand with this one that regulates water it is called the antidiuretic uh, antidiuretic hormone or adh secreted by the pituitary gland uh, 1.2.4 a flammable gas produced in land fields what is that flammable gas that is produced in land fields? It is methane or CH4. CH4 is just the molecular structure of, or, of uh, methane. So you can write it like that, either methane or CH4. It basically means the same thing. And the four should be down there. I'm sorry about that, not up there. And then uh, question 1.2.5, areas with porous rock that store water. Where are those areas? Areas that, that have porous rock that stores water. It's the aquifer. And then next question 1.2.6, the part of the brain that regulates breathing. I mentioned it now when I was explaining to you the regulation the, the investigation of the police the, the investigators with the increased breathing rate so it was the regulation of carbon dioxide which part of the body regulates breathing it is the medulla oblongata i mentioned that that is the control center in the homeostatic control of carbon dioxide concentration and then 1.2.7 the process of maintaining a constant internal environment of the main body. I have been mentioning this one. It's homeostasis. And then 1.2.8, the membrane part, the membrane that together with the endometrium forms the placenta. So together, this it's this membrane plus endometrium. When they are together, they will flow, form the placenta. That is called the chorion. 1.2.9. The structure in the head of a sperm containing digestive enzymes. What is that structure? It is the acrosome, contains digestive enzymes. That is it for question 1.2. Now, moving on to question 1.3. Indicate whether each of the statements in column one applies, on, applies to A only, B only, both A and B or none so that's how you write your answers you write 1.3.1 none 1.3.1 a only 1.3.1 b only 1.3.1 both a and b depending on what your answer is yeah? so you don't repeat the words you just you really like follow instructions guys so you don't waste your time when you write your answers here you will have enough time you'll be relaxed as long as you follow questions you can write your paper relaxed and you'll be able to finish and even get time to check your answers 1.3.1 ne? unfertilized eggs are released from the female's body this happens through asexual reproduction or external fertilization and the answer is b only that only happens during external fertilization during ancestral reproduction, it's just the, the, it's usually the process of binary fusion whereby the, the cell would itself divide with no external fertilization required to just be the one parent cell, right? And then uh, 1.3.2, the plant hormone that helps plant seeds to survive unfavorable conditions, for example, droughts. Which one is it? Is it the 
gibberellins or abscisic acid. So this one helps plants, uh, this helps the plant seeds survive unfavorable conditions. That is abscisic acid. Remember we've discussed it briefly, this term, ne? So it's still fresh in your minds. 1.3.3, hormones secreted by the pituitary gland. Which hormone is secreted by the pituitary gland? Is it prolactin or is it the growth hormone? Which one? Remember the pituitary gland is also called the master gland in that it's involved in the processes of other glands. So it secretes quite a lot of hormones. And in this case, the ones given here, it secretes both of them. So it secretes both the prolactin and the growth hormone. So question 1.3, we are done. Congratulations, how's the market going so far? You will tell me. Then question 1.4. The diagrams below show the re response of the human eye to two different conditions. So diagram A, you see the, it, 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 you see, look at these areas here. It's darker, it's larger, it has increased. Then here it has decreased. Diagram two, let's note the differences. It is more stretched out over here and it's bigger. But this side here, it is, it's, it's constricted and it's smaller. So let us now identify parts A, B, and C. A, B, and C. A is the sclera, B is the lens, and C is the ciliary body. So let's go label sclera. Uh, let me check for it. A is the sclera. B is the eye lens over there. And then C is the ciliary body or the ciliary muscle. Okay, and then question 1.4.2. Identify the process in diagram one. What process is happening here? Remember the work we learned and look at the diagram clearly. It is the pupillary mechanism. Pupillary mechanism, as you can see. In one picture, the pupil is dilated. In the other one, it is it's it's relaxed it's not dilated anymore so you understand you see that that is the pupillary mechanism that happens question 1.4.3 name the part of the eye that is responsible for the response in diagram one so what part of the eye is responsible for the pupillary mechanism name that part it is the iris iris is responsible for the response which is called pupillary mechanism. Then 1.4.4, state the consequence of the person's vision if the process in diagram two does not occur. So if the process here in diagram two does not occur, you see where in one part the lens is, 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 is constricted and the other part it's, it's dilated, it has increased. The ciliary body, uh, it controls that the, the, the movement there. What is it? What is the consequence of to the person's vision if that process in diagram two does not happen? If there would be near vision will be blurred, this near vision will be blurred, or only distant objects will be clearly visible. Remember the topic of discussing the eye. So if this process here does not happen, only things that are far off distance will be visible. But the ones in the nearby position wouldn't be visible to this person. So it will be near blindness. Ne? Then they'll need a specific type of special types of uh, glasses. 
And so it's, it's, it would be blurred, just blurred. When they look at objects closer to them, it would be blurred. But when they look far off, it would be, it would be clearer. And then other people have the reverse, whereby if they look at nearby objects, they can see clearly, but distant objects, they can't see perfectly. Then question 1.5. The diagram below represents an endocrine gland. A. So this endocrine gland is called A. And the events that take place in the ovary during the menstrual cycle in humans. So this here, look at the processes here. This is the gland, endocrine gland A. Then you have processes that take place in the, in the ovary during the menstrual cycle in human beings. A, 1.5.1 A, identify gland A. What is gland A? What gland is involved in the process there or in the reproductive system or in the gonads? That is the pituitary gland over there. It's also called what? The hypophysis. Hypophysis. Hypophysis, I'm sorry. Question B, structure B. What is structure B? You see the, the process, the steps during the menstrual cycle, right? Those are the relevant steps until here. Rapture is over there. You see the processes, they follow each other. So what is structure B? That is the graphene follicle. And what is inside the graphene follicle over there? You see, this is the graphene follicle. What is inside there, the graphene follicle? Which is, um, what is process C? That is ovulation. Ovulation, what happens? So the process, they're asking about the process, right? It is ovulation. But if they ask the structure, C, that would be the egg that is being released every month during the cycle. So the process is ovulation, but the structure is the egg cell or the ovule. And then D, structure D, what is the structure D now? The egg has been uh, it's released through ovulation, right? So this one here, what is structure D now? That is the corpus luteum. So you see, corpus luteum is the result after the egg has been released. Do you follow this process? Follow it. It's very important to understand, especially during the menstrual cycle as well as the reproductive cycle. You can even see here, you have the this pituitary gland will secrete also what we call the follicle-stimulating hormone. There's another hormone that plays a role, which we didn't discuss now. I was responsible for the secretion of other hormones here in this process. Remember that work we did on endocrine glands? Review it. 1.5.2, state the effect of the estrogen levels in the blood, in the blood if gland A stops secreting follicle stimulating hormone, which is FSH, right? Follicle stimulating hormone is FSH. So what would be the effect on the estrogen levels in the blood if gland A stops secreting follicle stimulating hormone? So if gland A, which is the pituitary gland, stops stimulating follicle stimulating hormone, what then would be the effect on the estrogen levels? they will remain low or they will decrease. Why? Because they are secreted by the follicle stimulating hormone. Oestrogen is secreted by the follicle stimulating hormone. And then 1.5.3, state one function of LH. What is LH? It's the luteinizing hormone. This one, luteinizing hormone stimulates ovulation. It also then stimulates the development of the corpus luteum. So there, it stimulates this process here of ovulation, thereby stimulating the formation of the corpus luteum. Uh, do we still have time? Okay, it's 8.45. We'll do this, we'll continue our work tomorrow from this page now, but you are still more than welcome to send me any questions you may have or queries, and I'll gladly assist you. Thank you so much for everything. <laughs> All the best, take care of yourselves, bye.